So, good morning, everyone. Uh, probably from the fact that you see me chairing also this session, you can easily infer that uh, uh, Roberto is still uh, ill, and uh, he told me that unfortunately he won't be able to make it to come today. We wish him all the best, uh, and, uh, and we start with session two. In session two uh, of this conference, the idea is that of uh, uh, trying to capture the distinctiveness of the supranational judiciary from a comparative perspective. And therefore, to look at it uh, with, uh, in, in relation to uh, several uh, alternative uh, models of judicial organization, uh, the first that will be uh, dealt with by uh, Professor Raffaele Bifulco is that of uh, the federal judiciary, the judicial organization within uh, federal uh, political communities. The second is uh, the experience of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and this is uh, uh, a task assigned to uh, Johann Solanes Mulo. And uh, finally, we, we will discuss again of uh, European Convention on Human Rights, uh, whereas yesterday the question was uh, what are the relationship within, uh, between uh, the uh, European Court of Justice and the supranational judiciary and the CHR in, the, in dispute uh, resolution, in adjudication. Uh, today, the the comparison is, uh, uh, oh, the discussion on the ECHR and uh, the supranational judiciary has a, a more uh, comparative uh, approach and uh, is based on um, confronting the distinctiveness of the judicial apparatus entrusted with the enforcement of EU law and the judicial organization in charge of uh, uh, enforcing European human rights. So uh, this is the program, for the, the program for the morning. The idea is that we, we, we can have uh, uh, the presentations and uh, after the coffee break that perhaps will be a little bit later than 10.30, uh, uh, we will uh, open the discussion, uh, the floor to the discussion. Professor okay. Rafael Bifur. Thank you. Um, reading the title of my speech, um, a question arises, uh, better, some questions arise. Um, why do we compare the Court of Justice of the European Union, ECJ, with federal judiciaries? Uh, does this comparison imply that the European Union is a federal order? or at least that is like a federal order? Or do we think that European Union is going through a federal process? Um, I think it's better to wait and try to answer at the end of this report. In the first part, I will try to sketch some features and functions of federal judiciaries through a static and a dynamic approach then I will try to compare the supranational judiciary to um, federal judiciaries. And yet my main purpose is to emphasize the material limits to this comparison. That's why I will make use of some extraordinary intuitions of Carl Schmitt on federalism and pluralism. And I will finish with some reflection on constitutional pluralism. I will observe the relationship between the Court of Justice of the European Union and models of federal judiciary through two complementary approaches. A static approach oriented to verify how the federal judiciaries are organized from a territorial perspective. The static approach also refers to territorial organization of judiciaries in federal systems. Federal states 
uh, characterized by a vertical and um, horizon horizontal dimension of fundamental state functions. The judiciary system uh, makes no exception to this general rule. A, dynam a dynamic approach oriented to verify how federal systems resolve judicial uh, conflicts. The dynamic approach looks in particular at ways in which um, a federal systems resolve the judicial conflicts that arise between central and territorial entities, between federal or central authorities, and territorial authorities, or between different territorial authorities. Conflicts between central and territorial authorities concerning the scope of their respective powers are inevitable in federal systems, which resolve these conflicts through specific procedures. In these cases, we will see constitutional courts play a fundamental role. Um, let me begin with a static approach. There are significant differences in the configuration of judicial power. I think we can re refer to the concept of associative and dissociative uh, federalisms to draw the line between the the sign of the judiciary according to classic double judiciary order, uh, dual model, a link to the distribution of tasks and the design of the judiciary as a single instance, unitary model. In the latter model, the evolutionary process does not reach the court order and there is not a double parallel level of courts. The difference uh, becomes particularly clear when comparing the most representative systems of both families. Those in federal countries like uh, USA, Australia, or Argentina, the formulation of federal judiciary is clear. In Belgium, India, Austria, Italy, Spain, the first formally federal and the latter described as such, despite the lack of a formal definition, there is a single judicial power and federated entities do not have responsibilities in the field of justice, at least substantial ones, and there is no separate judicial power. Of course, we should take into account some differences. Mexico, Canada, Germany have some interesting specificities that I can't anal analyze now. Um, countries with a single judiciary uh, show fewer and less uh, significant modulations. The only salient issues are the adaptation of judicial structure to the territorial division or the internal distribution of powers between the courts, taking into account the distribution of tasks between the federation and federate, federated entities. In one case, Spain, some powers are granted to the federated entities, either in setting the jurisdictional boundaries of some courts, or organizational ones related to the staff and resources to support judges. In any case, these powers relate to issues that do not impair the existence of a single judicial power. Um, now I came to the dynamic approach. Here we find two main models, the so-called constitutional model and the judicial review model. I will begin with the first one. The constitutional model is the European model for resol uh, resolving conflicts between central and territorial authorities. In the European federal systems, the constitutional courts have assumed two main tasks, the constitutional review of legislation and the resolution of conflicts between public authorities. Um, a preliminary but relevant character of this model is the composition of constitutional courts. In the European constitutional model, members of the constitutional courts are normally designated by the state territorial entities play a minor role in the appointment of the members of the court. 
um, with the exception of Bundesrat in Germany and the Senate in Spain. But in the United States, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, the president appoints the justice of the uh, Supreme Court with the advice or approval of Senate. Similarly, in Australia and Canada, the appointment of judges is within the exclusive branch of the government, governor, general, and council. Only in Switzerland, in contrast to any other federal state, federal judges are appointed by the legislature. From this point of view, the, uh, the European Union keeps up its international blueprint. Every member state, as we know, appoints one judge, although something is going to change. The Lisbon Treaty established indeed the so-called Article 255 panel. The panel is, as we know, composed of seven members from former national Isles court judges and constitutional judges, as well as former ECG mm, judges. The European Parliament nominates one of the panel members, whereas the president of the Luxembourg Court suggests all the others. All panel members are appointed by the European Council for a term of four years, renewable ones. The panel has the task, after interviewing the candidates and deliberating in private, to deliver either <clears throat> a favorable or an unfavorable reasoned opinion on the suitability of both first-time candidates and candidates suggested for reappointment by the member states. So far, seven national candidates for judges at the General Court of the European Union have received negative opinions and were later replaced by their governments. It remains to be seen whether in the future the panel will also bait a nomination for the ECJ. However, also the panel 255 has had some positive effects on the selection of judges it has also been criticized um, for its wide discretion in setting selection criteria. Some words about the constitutional model. Um, let's now examine how different ways, um, uh, the different ways for resolving conflicts between central and territorial entities in the constitutional model. We can mark out two proceedings, general procedures for the judicial review and the protection of rights, specific proceedings that may be brought before constitutional court. As general procedure, we mean direct appeals or concrete con control. In this case, the conflict derives from a law enacted by a legislative assembly. By means of abstract control, Germany, Austria, Spain, Italy after 2001, the central authority challenges the norms of the territorial authorities by lodging appeals of unconstitutionality. At the same time, the authorities of territorial entities may initiate uh, proceedings at the constitutional courts to challenge the central law which they deem unconstitutional. We have something similar in the European Union system with cases where the applicant, in this case a member state, seeks the annulment for a measure supposedly contrary to European Union law, annulment article 2063. Or in case of infringement of European Union law where an institution, body, office or agency has failed to act. Article 265. In some countries, such as Portugal and Austria, among others, there is a system of preventive control of constitutionality. A ruling may also rise in the course of concrete proceedings of constitutional review, it is in specific proceedings, in which the judge hearing the case questions the constitutionality of the applicable law and refers the case to the Constitutional Court for preliminary ruling. The preliminary ruling has played a fundamental role in the, constru in the construction of the European Union system. All relevant doctrines were formulated in preliminary rulings, as we know. Specific procedures are usually applied in cases in which the conflict does not arise from a law, 
but rather from administrative or fiscal measures. The question becomes whether the central or territorial entity has respected the constitutional apportionment of powers in the exercise of their power. In these cases, doubts arise about the jurisdiction. Do ordinary courts or constitutional courts have jurisdiction in administrative matters? Many constitutions of European countries, Austria, mm, Germany, Spain, have preferred the jurisdiction of the constitutional court. The above quoted proceedings for annulment can be referred to this kind of constitutional procedure. Although the specific rule of procedure vary according to the legal order, there are some characteristics in common. For example, standing to initiate the proceedings is reserved for the executive branch of both levels of government, excluding parliaments and private persons. In European law, a uh, system proceeding for annulment may be brought either by member state institution or by any natural or legal person if the action relates to measures, in particular a regulation or a decision, adopted by an European Union institution, body or agency and addressed to them. In the end, we have to mention the constitutional complaint proceedings, sometimes constitutional courts resolve territorial conflicts through proceedings designed to defend, to protect the fundamental rights. Recurso di amparo, Verfassungsbeschwerde. In dissociative federalism, a privileged position is reserved to the central government. We do not find this feature in European Union law. Member state and the European Union institution have the same powers. Uh, the judicial review model, just a few words, in countries such as Switzerland, Uni United States or Canada, which do not have a constitutional courts uh, in the European meaning, um, which do not have a concentrated system of constitutional jurisdiction, judges in the ordinary courts play an important role in the resolution of conflicts between territorial entities. They can refuse to apply laws which are contrary to the Constitution, including rules that violate constitutional apportionment of powers. Uh, compared to these models, the European model seems to be an original, mixed one, in balance between the dual model, as far as the organization of judiciary is concerned, and the unitary model, as far as the resolution of conflict is concerned. Komarek uh, uh, says quasi-federal judicial system. There are many formal similarities between supranational and federal judiciaries. At this point, we should, I should analyze the multiple tools invented by the ECJ to assure the primacy of the European Union law, direct effect, supremacy, protection of fundamental rights, member state liability. In my opinion, the comparison reaches a fundamental limit relating to the nature, to the essence of these systems. I mean the supranational and the federal ones. And in particular to the relationships between central and territorial entities. I think there is a fundamental difference between supranational and federal judiciaries consisting in what I would call the openness of the sovereignty question issue. Uh, whereas the constitutional courts are part of federal systems in which the sovereignty question has been resolved, the ECJ is part of a legal system in which the sovereignty question has not been resolved yet. We should be careful when we speak about federalism and federal state. Actually, we are accustomed to think federalism as a federal state better as a unitary federal state. Let's add that in present days, 
the space for new experiences of associative federalism becomes more and more narrow. What we experience are forms of dissociative federalism. Maybe the only real experience of associative federalism is the European one. And yet I'm persuaded that to better understand the European experience, we have to look at the starting periods of classic federal states. For classic federal states, I mean those federal state, states come into being through the union of persisting entities. In my opinion, there are many similarities between classic federalism and European Union. The most important one relates to the sovereignty question. When classic federal states took form, the sovereignty question, which is a, the decision about a fundamental conflict, was still open. With the words of Carl Schmitt, the openness of the sovereignty question was the price to pay if the pre-existing entities wanted to avoid the formation of a unitary federal state. By the means of the open sovereignty, a new federal equilibrium came into being in order to favor the coexistence between different entities. In those experiences, the equilibrium broke down when the decision about the sovereignty is, was taken. Can we identify a precise moment when this happens? On this subject, I found, as I said, absolutely fascinating. The reflection of Carl Schmitt exposed in the last pages of, uh, of his Verfassungslehre, published in uh, um, 1928, the German author thinks that when democracy prevails on federal organization, in particular when the sovereign becomes the people, he meant one people and not the people of the states, then the federal equilibrium breaks down and a unitary federal state come, comes into being. The Germany of the Weimar Republic and the, United, and the United States in those days were, for Schmidt, examples of this kind of federal states. I came to the conclusion. No doubt that Carl Schmidt has been one of the most controversial figures of contemporary public, modern public law. At the same time, his work has exercised, uh, has exercised an undeniable influence over a large part of the contemporary constitutional doctrine. It so happened that some uh, other contemporary scholars remind us of the similarities between the starting moment of associative federalism and the present experience of the European Union. My thought goes to Ser Giortino, and to Olivier Beau. What is surprising for me is to find some common features between Schmidt's reflections on federalism and the part of the European constitutional mainstream. In particular, I'm thinking to the so-called constitutional pluralism. Um, of course, I'm aware that differences are also relevant, especially if we look at the general context environment in which Carl Schmitt wrote his Verfassungslehre. Anyway, the problems, I think, are where and are the same, how balancing unity and pluralism. And I would say the same for the solution, for the solutions proposed. For this purpose, uh, let me sketch the main features of constitutional pluralism. I would qualify the first feature as the incommensurability issue. An incommensurability of the knowledge and the authority or sovereignty claims emanating from these sides. I'm quoting, uh, Ian, uh, I'm quoting Walker. The starting point is here the existence of distinct constitutional sides, it does the European Union and member states. The second feature can be qualified as the no-fixed conflict solution. 
uh, in the European legal system, the conflict has no precise answer. Some pluralists think that conflict is an exceptional case, Boyares Maduro, or a question that must be resolved by political actor, not by legal ones, McCormick, the first McCormick, or yet through the principle of loyalty. In other words, the judicial conflict is, I would say, normalized, is brought back to normal. That's why the theories of constitutional pluralism refuse to use traditional legal concept, such as competence, competence, which becomes nothing more than, I'm quoting uh, Walker, nothing more than a powerful index of constitutional maturity. The third feature overlaps with the sovereignty question. Constitutional pluralists think that the idea of sovereignty is open, not decided. We heard Maduro yesterday. Maduro speaks of competitive, competing uh, sovereignties. So sovereignty becomes an uncertain concept whose determining character is autonomy, not exclusivity. The last feature relates to the democratic deficit issue. I would say, and I hope not to appear too simplistic uh, in what I'm saying, I'm going to say that me, the so-called democratic deficit is accepted by pluralists as a matter of fact. Some pluralists wish the deficit overcoming, Poyaris Maduro, some others believe in the how to say, auto-saving capacity of the law from a broad constitutional perspective, law and politics, I'm quoting, are most aptly conceived of as mutually constitutive and mutually contain those challenging this presumption of the credibility, still less of the necessity of an a priori political community worker. In the end, others retain that the deficit is actually compensated by the democracy of national institutions in Golf Bernice. To conclude, in a pro provocative way, um, Miguel is not here. In my opinion, Carl Schmitt and constitutional pluralism are not so far. Mutatis mutandis both think that the European constitutional status quo is the only solution more democracy will actually mean to leave the present federal equilibrium and starting a new road to an a unitary, unitary federal state. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you to Raffaele Bifulco for this, uh, this presentation and um, it was very rich in detail at the beginning, and then uh, it arrived at a, a more theoretical and uh, abstract uh, conclusion. Uh, it remains to be understood probably whether uh, constitutional pluralism is a possible configuration of federalism, and which seems to me your view of it, or whether, and this is maybe something will be discussed even in the next sessions, uh, it is a pluralism which uh, has its own peculiarities and uh, treating it within the federal uh, framework uh, is accurate from a descriptive point of view. But this is something that probably we can discuss later. I would uh, leave the floor now to uh, Johan Solanes Mouillot, um, who is going to take a, a totally different uh, standpoint and uh, the one of uh, the comparison with the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Thank Please you very join. much, Professor Marco Dani. Thank you very much to Professor Roberto Toniatis, Marco Dani, and Bifulco for uh, giving me the opportunity to participate in uh, this conference. And thank you very much to Professor Roberto Toniati and, and all his team, you know, especially the youngest, uh, for all this time in Trento that has been wonderful and very productive. And, I, uh, and it was because uh, of all of you. Well, yes, I've been entrusted with the task of uh, comparing the Inter-American human rights system and the European Union supranational judiciary. 
This is a difficult task in that sense. Um, is the Inter-American Human Rights System a supranational judiciary? Uh, well, I try to, to answer this question, but uh, it is a preliminary approach. It is a preliminary assessment, open to debate and discussion. And uh, I hope also with Monica Klaes in that sense, we bring some light in relation to uh, the nature of the Inter-American Human Rights System and the European Convention on Human Rights in comparison with uh, the, uh, the supranational judiciary. No? Well, here you have the summary of my presentation. I'll uh, first deal with the two uh, theses uh, debated under the scholarship, uh, the supranational thesis versus the classical international law thesis. Uh, then I will briefly categorize the, uh, uh, the, supra the model of comparison, the European supranational judiciary. It is a pity that we don't have the overview of uh, Professor Roberto Toniati uh, uh, the first day. Uh, I will give my modest contribution in a very simple way as well because it is impossible for me to do, to do as, you know, as Roberto Toniati will do that. And uh, then I, I will discuss the, the, the cornstone, uh, what I will uh, call the supranational aspiration of the Inter-American Human Rights System, that this is the conventionality control doctrine, el control de convencionalidad. And then I will discuss two internal issues of this doctrine and uh, as well the national response to the, the supranational aspiration of the Inter-American Human Rights System. Well, first, the, the two opposing theses between the scholarship. Uh, the supranationality thesis uh, has been argued under different levels, under different legal constructions and theories, um, constitutional pluralism also in the Inter-American system, multi-level constitutionalism, judicial dialogue theories, also the use commune no, terminology of the Box Gandhi School uh, at the Max Planck. Uh, well, in short, this supranationality thesis uh, argues that the Inter-American human rights system is a unique uh, legal system with a unique uh, judiciary with two tires, the Inter-American tire that is composed by the Commission and the Court of Inter-American Human Rights, and the national tire with national judges. And these two tires are highly coordinated uh, through especially the conventionality control, no? that is the glue of the two tires. Uh, they use a, a very uh, brilliant expression that uh, also uh, we use here at the European level that national judges, Latin American judges at the national level are, are also inter-American judges, no? uh, like we, uh, we, uh, uh, we say as well from European national judges when they apply European Union law. No? Uh, well, it, it should be highlighted that this supranational thesis is mainly supported by uh, current and former uh, inter-American judges. Mm? McGregor, Garcia Sayan, Sergio Garcia Ramirez, Fic, uh, Fix Tamudio, the big names in the sense of the Inter-American Human Rights System. And uh, there is less enthusiasm at the national level between national scholars and uh, national judges. Mm? Uh, uh, this is a symptom that the supranationality uh, thesis comes from the Inter-American level and it has less popularity at the national level. No? Because between national scholars and national judges, uh, it is much common, much widespread in that sense, the classical national thesis, the, the classical international law thesis about the Inter-American Human Rights System, that is, that the Inter-American Human Rights system, system is like the European Convention on Human Rights, and the position of the Inter-American Court is very similar to the European Court of Human Rights. There is no a unique legal system. There are two separated legal systems, the international law system and uh, the national system, and they are coordinated through the classical subsidiarity principle. And, uh, and, and also the, the all categories of monism, dualism, depending on the state, in that sense, the reception of uh, the, inter the international law. Well, my own thesis is that the inter-American human rights system is building its supranationality. It's trying to do that, but uh, it's doing that in a context of weak foundations, lack of judicial cooperation mechanisms, and also in a context of uh, national contestation, especially a strong national contestation, and this jeopardizes this supranational aspiration of the Inter-American Human Rights System. Well, before going into the details uh, of the Inter-American Human Rights System, uh, let me just briefly categorize the model of comparison, but with a very simplistic way in that sense. Uh, 
Well, I, I think that uh, the concept of supranational judiciary is very related to the concept of supranational legal order. And uh, this is a very unique, singular European phenomenon, I can say in that sense. No? Uh, I think that the, supranational, the supranationality of the European Union legal order is rooted uh, on uh, the specific foundations of the European integration process and the European integration goals. No? That, uh, I think that the, the paper of Marco Dani is very clear in relation to that. Uh, the first phase, no? the goals are a little bit less ambitious. Uh, they are uh, building an internal market. But, but it is, still, it is still ambitious, that. And, and the second phase is much more than that, is creating a more perfect union, maybe a new constitutional architecture. We can discuss that in that sense, no? But uh, the EU legal order uh, 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 needs this autonomy and effectiveness precisely for safeguarding this, uh, this uh, European integration process. And the primacy uh, doctrine and the direct effect doctrine and all the language of the ECJ, it's uh, See, appear as some natural consequence for safeguarding this autonomy and effectiveness. This is the functional approach, no? like uh, it's saying, calling an, or maybe we can root also to the constitutional approach to the European Union legal order. No? Um, but uh, this supranational legal order needs a judiciary whose aim is precisely uh, safeguarding this autonomy and effectiveness of EU law, and the two tires the European Union judges and national judges solved the conflicts between uh, EU law, that in which in this sense EU law represents the European integration goals, and the national law that represents maybe the diversity, uh, different ways to do the things that can clash with uh, the European integration process. And they solve these conflicts applying the primacy and direct effect through, and this is another characteristic of the supranational judiciary thing, through a formal uh, judicial cooperation mechanisms, very highly developed judicial mechanisms in that sense. And uh, I, I am not talking about informal mechanisms like networks, formal uh, uh, judicial cooperation mechanisms, and you know very well these, uh, these formal mechanisms, no? the preliminary reference, that is, is the, the jewel of the crown no? of the system, but you also have consistent interpretation, uh, the disapplication also mechanism, and then you have uh, a little bit more, uh, not too clear, uh, judicial cooperation mechanisms, but they are used, the deference proportionality principle, especially in some fields of EU law, in non-discrimination law, uh, that the ECJ gives some deference to the national judges in applying the proportionality principle, maybe can give some clues about the application of this proportionality principle, but the, the national judges are in charge of applying this proportionality principle, and also the uh, comparative method, that there are a lot of critiques about uh, the use of this comparative method about the ECJ and national judges, but still you can say that they are using this method. Well, returning to the Inter-American Human Rights System, I will say that the conventionality control, the control of the conventionalidad, is the, uh, is the uh, proposal of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights for building the, the supranationality of the system. Uh, this is now a 10 years old doctrine, uh, it was first declared in 2006 in the case of Monacita Arellano y otros versus Chile, and is still used by the court. Um, th this, is a much, uh, this is much more than the old concept or the, the international law concept of reviewing national law in light of international law. This is much more than that. And this is uh, because this doctrine establish, uh, establishes two elements that are so important. The Inter-American Human Rights uh, Instruments mainly the American Convention on Human Rights, but also all the instruments that help to interpret the American Convention on Human Rights, especially the American Declaration of Human Rights, but also sectorial uh, human rights treaties. All these uh, human rights instruments uh, are at the top at the, uh, of the national legal sources, and these instruments also apply directly at the national level. The aspirations of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights are pretty clear in that sense. The conventionality control changes, modifies the hierarchy of the national legal sources and also goes far beyond the mere declaration of international responsibility of, uh, in, in international classical law, no? in that sense. Uh, also, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has said that uh, not only the states have the duty to apply directly the Inter-American Human Rights instruments, but also they have to apply it ex officio. Uh, all the authorities, especially courts, have to apply 
uh, these mechanisms ex officio. And of course, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights says a precision, uh, the commensality control must be applied uh, in accordance with the national competence and national procedures uh, established at the national level. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter for the court if you have a judicial review of legislation model that is concentrated or disconcentrated, centralized or decentralized. You have to apply the conventionality control. But maybe you can see that maybe there is a problem if you have a centralized model of judicial review and your ordinary judges cannot disapply uh, legislation that is conflicting with the Constitution or the American Convention on Human Rights. Because it seems that the conventionality control is a kind of decentralized model of judicial review. Well, finally, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights established, formally establishes two uh, uh, judicial cooperation mechanisms that, it is, uh, that they are the consistent interpretation and the disapplication mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Well, the first issue of the conventionality control is that this is built on weak foundations. Mm -hmm. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights has not developed the special foundations like the ECJ for primacy and direct effect doctrines, because maybe it's not able to do that. The Inter-American human rights system is, after all, a human rights protection system. It's not an integration process. And, and then the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has relied on classical international law arguments. The Vienna Convention on uh, the, uh, the Law of the Treaties, Article 26, the Pacta Sunt Servanda, classical Pacta Sunt Servanda, uh, Article 27 and 31, they are, you cannot invoke internal law for uh, justifying breaching in international law, or the bona fide o effet util principles, classical international law arguments. Mm. Also has relied the American Court on Human Rights uh, on Article 1 and 2 of the American Convention on Human Rights. Um, these are uh, two broad articles, but Article 2 is especially powerful. We don't have a similar article in the European Convention on Human Rights System, and this article establishes that uh, all the states uh, have to undertake all the necessary measures necessary that, that are necessary for uh, making effective the rights and freedoms recognized in the American Convention on Human Rights. But still, it is powerful, but um, the, uh, this article has never been understood as changing the national legal sources and the mere international uh, uh, responsibility of the state. It has to develop uh, um, pretty substantive arguments, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, for understanding that Article 2 is sustaining, is maintaining the conventionality control. Mm? Then you have a, a very strange movement of the court. I, I will uh, say that maybe this is not important. But um, that it seems that jeopardizes the position of the court, and it's a, it's a movement of, made by the own court, uh, that is this resolution of compliance in the Hellman case, uh, that the court distinguishes between two kinds of effects of its judgments. Mm -hmm. uh, when, this, when the state is part of the controversy, the court is saying that uh, the judgment is fully applicable, is fully mandatory, but maybe if uh, the state's that are not part in the uh, controversy, maybe not. Mm? This is very strange, and it isn't a resolution, resolution of compliance, it's not in a judgment. The, the language of the court is very unclear in that sense, maybe has not bad reper repercussions no, in that sense, or bad consequences, but it seems that maybe can jeopardize the erga omnes effects of its judgments, no? but maybe it's not important, and we cannot be uh, worried about that. Mm? Finally, uh, uh, you cannot find, at the national level, clauses of integration, mm? constitutional clauses of integration, uh, like you find in some uh, European constitutions. There are, in the Latin American constitutions, clauses of integration, yes, but they refer to other realities, not to the inter-American human rights system. They refer to Mercosur, to Comunidad Andina, to uh, Asociación Libre de Estados del Caribe, and so on. Really, a reality is that are integration processes, economic and political integration processes, and not the inter-American human rights system. It seems that the image from the constitutional level is that the inter-American human rights system is not an integration process as well. No? The second issue, uh, first, is the weak foundations. The second issue of the commission control is the lack of judicial coordination mechanisms. 
There are two ways, two classical ways of interaction between the inter-American level and the national level, the contentious cases and the advisor opinion. The contentious cases, well, you know, it's the, you apply here the classical subsidiarity principle in the sense that first intervenes the national level and then if there is not a national remedy, the inter-American level. Uh, but with a qualification that here in the inter-American system you have a non-judicial body in between the two judicial tiers. That it, this body is the commission, the inter-American commission on human rights. I think that this is important, uh, the role of the commission is very important because that determines the docket of the court. As you know, in the inter-American system, uh, individuals uh, uh, lack standing hmm, uh, before the court. And uh, the commission is, uh, is in charge of this, hmm, of determining, of bringing cases before the court. And the commission, in that sense, distorts the direct communication between the two judicial tires, the national tire and the court uh, in the inter-American level. Also politicizes the system. And in that sense, it uh, makes less judicial in nature all the system. Hmm? And advisory opinions. In the inter-American human rights system, advisory opinions are so important. Hmm? are very important in that sense. States can consult the Inter-American Court on Human Rights uh, on matters of interpretation of Inter-American Human Rights instruments, but this is a tool not in hands of judges. Hmm? The governments are doing this uh, and are using the advisory opinion. Hmm? There are proposals of changing the advisory opinion and making and transforming this advisory opinion in a sort of uh, preliminary reference and proposals like protocol uh, number 16 to the European Convention on Human Rights, but still this is not the case, and the advisory opinions is not available for national judges. As we have seen, uh, there are only two formally declared uh, judicial cooperation mechanisms, consistent interpretation and this application, and we don't have uh, the preliminary reference, and we don't have as well the proportionality pre principle and deference in the system. It is quite curious to uh, hear national scholars at the Latin American level saying that maybe it's a good thing to adopt the margin of appreciation doctrine in the inter-American human rights system that is heavily contested here in uh, Europe uh, between the scholarship. And uh, finally, the uh, comparative method well, there are a lot of critiques in uh, how is using the comparative method the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. A lot of national scholars are saying that the Inter-American Court of Human Rights is not taking into account the national developments, the national case law, when it's, decide, when it's, when it's deciding cases. No? And maybe it's true. Uh, the the Inter-American Court of Human Rights rarely uh, um, quotes national case law. It is very strange. Well, Finally, uh, for uh, concluding in that sense this presentation, uh, I want to make a quick overview about the national response to the supranational aspiration of the inter-American human rights system. It seems, at, at first glance, it seems that there is a positive reaction at the national level. Because you have good textual basis for the primacy principle, especially, that entails the conventionality control, and also because it seems also that you have good judicial partners in implementing the uh, uh, the conventionality control, but this is only the surface in that sense. Mm? Uh, good uh, textual basis. Yes, this is true. Uh, the so-called Latin American neoconstitutionalism, uh, well, gives a special status to human rights treaties, if you compare with ordinary or other international uh, uh, treaties, but uh, still you have huge difference between the national constitutions in Latin America in relation with the rank of the uh, human rights treaties. In some countries, these treaties rank as constitutional, in other ones, uh, rank as supralegal, and other uh, rank as legal. And you can see, about in relation to the states that rank as legal, here you have the Commonwealth, hmm? the Commonwealth states. This is another problem of the human rights system, like he, also here in Europe, uh, is dealing, the human rights, the inter-American human rights system is dealing with different legal cultures. No, in that sense, and this is always difficult to manage. You have in the system, civil law systems, you have a mixture of civil law, common law systems, and you have more pure common law systems. And also you have indigenous law, no? surfing all the systems, eh? all the legal cultures, and this makes the task a little bit tough, eh? very difficult for the inter-American human rights system. But uh, also, uh, 
none of the constitution uh, establish the uh, uh, the supranationality uh, that the, that the uh, the human rights cities are above the constitution no none of them uh, of this uh, of this constitution but if you have a constitutional rank then you have achieved a lot of things and maybe the primacy could be uh, could be established in that sense and you have another problem as well maybe the constitution could be so clear establishing the rank but then in practice you have so many problems because you have political circumstances or qualifications of the national uh, of the national case law the highest courts in that sense and you have positive or bad or mm, a good examples in relation to that no venezuela is the bad example mm? the constitution of venezuela is very clear the uh, treaties human rights treaties rank as constitutional as constitutional but the, the, the reality is completely different mm? and then you have positive examples like peru no in peru uh, the human rights treaties rank as super legal but the constitutional court of peru has stated that it rank as constitutional you have a good constitutional court from the inter-american human rights uh, perspective no in that sense well and it seems also that you have good judicial partners yes it is true you have good judicial partners but sometimes you have these partners that have the dark side no the dark side of the force now that we are you know, with star wars and and that sort of things well uh, it seems that also mm, sometimes they are not very good judicial partners mm? and you have here three examples mm? chile it is well known that the Supreme Court of Chile is much better good judicial partner than the Constitutional Court of Chile, and they overlap in the interpretation of uh, human rights treaties, because it's very quite strange, the system in Chile. You have Colombia. Yes, of course, eh? the Constitutional Court of Colombia is the paradigmatic eh? uh, good judicial partner of uh, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, but still, uh, it has decided not to follow the Lopez Mendoza case. In that sense, that the Constitutional Court of Colombia has, this, has declared constitutional the prerogatives of a public officer that can dismiss the unelected popular uh, public officers, in that sense. And this was declared contrary to the American Convention of Human Rights by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. No? And you have Mexico. We were talking this yesterday. You know, in that sense, Mexico, it's, a, it's completely a mess. You don't know what is happening what is going on in Mexico. On, on one hand, you have uh, the constitutional amendment uh, of 2011 and the decision of the Supreme Court of Mexico in Expediente Varios, that they are pretty clear. Mm, uh, the human rights treaties, human rights treaties rank as constitutional, and the, the method of solving uh, conflicts between uh, national Mexican law, including the constitution and the inter-American human rights system, uh, uh, is the consistent method the consistent interpretation method, far enough. Eh? It is quite good for the inter-American system. But then you have the contradiction thesis, another supreme uh, core decision that ranks above the expediente varios because also very difficult uh, hierarchy of the national uh, of the national case law in Mexico. And this contradiction of thesis says that uh, yes, human rights treaties rank as constitutional. This is true. But the method of solving conflicts, maybe it's not the consistent interpretation, it's the supremacy of the Constitution. We have the last word, Supreme Court, and especially using the promine principle. Hmm? Uh, that, that's, that is, says the Supreme Court, that we are going to apply in the specific case uh, the best interpretation for human rights. And I, I don't care if this interpretation comes from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights or comes from me, the Supreme Court in that sense, no? Maybe here you have a problem, but well, uh, still, good judicial partners, still, eh? in that sense. But along with this, you have, uh, you have a strong and explicit national judicial contestation from high courts, mm? and a very strong national contestation. Here you have the, the most serious cases. You have Brazil, there is an open war between the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and the Supreme Court of Brazil in relation to the amnesty cases. Mm? And also more problematic is that in Brazil there is a general ignorance about the Inter-American Court of Human Rights judgments. And this is very well known between the scholarship in that sense. With all this, with, the, with Roberto Caldas, that is the Inter-American judge appointed by Brazil or appointed 
or uh, proposed and then appointed by the Assembly of the States of the Organization of the States of American States. And he said that uh, maybe also there is a problem in Brazil that you have a problem of communication, of the language, you know, in that sense, because inter-American human rights system, the working language is Spanish, and Brazil, as you know, the Portuguese is the first language. And then he said that maybe he was, this, this was a problem as well. No? Then you have the Dominican Republic. Uh, well, this is all, uh, there is also an open war uh, in relation to the Haitian immigrant cases, uh, the discrimination of Haitian immigrants in uh, Dominican Republic. Uh, in the uh, that is uh, quite serious in that sense. And this ended this conflict with the judgment of the Constitutional Court of the Dominic uh, Republic, uh, stating that the ratification of the American Convention of Human Rights was unconstitutional because it was ratified by the President of the Republic and not by the Assembly. And then, and therefore, the effects of the, uh, of the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights is without effects in the Dominic Republic. Then you have the Uruguay case as well, very similar to Brazil, mm? an open war in relation to the amnesty cases between uh, the Supreme Court of Uruguay and the Inter-American Court of Human, Rights, of Human Rights, and then the Venezuela case as well. Mm -hmm. I, am, I am finishing. Uh, the Venezuela case, as you know, uh, there are a lot of conflicts uh, in relation to the independence, uh, the situation of the dependency of the judiciary in uh, Venezuela, and finally, it comes the withdrawal of Venezuela in 2012. Then you have also uh, um, uh, a state's uh, uh, contestation, not uh, the judicial, the national courts are not protagonists of that. You have the Boys case, the Yatama case in Nicaragua, Barbados, and Trinidad and Tobago as well. But I am not going to into the details of this, but also more national contestation uh, uh, against the Inter-American Court. And also you have finally the, the, the last issue that is we don't know exactly what is going on at the lower level with the lower courts. They are applying the conventionality control or not in the daily basis. Uh, we don't have data, we don't have a scholar attention to this issue, and I think that it's, it is important. No? And then, finally, then the conclusions. Uh, well, uh, the, my thesis is that, that the inter-American human rights system is building its supranationality, and this is a process very similar to the European Union. It has decided to follow the path of the European Union, but with qualifications in that sense. No? The conventional control uh, has, is based on uh, uh, weaker foundations at the primacy and the lead effect doctrines. You have the uh, Inter-American Commission on Human Rights that distorts the communication between the two ties. You have a stronger national contestation like in Europe, and you have fewer uh, judicial cooperation mechanisms, especially you don't have the preliminary reference. And then you have two options in relation to that. Uh, you can persist uh, on the supranationality path, the European Union path, and you can maintain your supremacy clause, and you can maintain the conventionality control, but maybe uh, uh, the uh, national contestation is going to increase mm, in that sense, and you don't have very good foundations, because I repeat again, the inter-American human rights system is a human rights protection system, is not an integration process, and maybe this is an issue for the system. Or, or, or then, this, the second possibility is to follow the path of the European Court of Human Rights, the soft path, no, in that sense, and f forgetting the supranationality clause, forgetting the conventionality control, and adopt a more classical way of interaction between national, uh, the national level and the inter-American level, based on the subsidiarity principle and more uh, leave, leave, leave way, you know, more deference in that sense uh, to the national players. No? And it's quite successful, the way that the European Court of Human Rights has used uh, this, uh, this, uh, this more relaxed way you know, to approach the national judges and not stating a supranational uh, clause like the Convention to Control, the Primacy Principles and Direct Effect at the European Union level. No? Thanks. Otherwise, we could have, uh, if you agree, uh, the, the coffee break and then uh, Monica and then discussion because uh, we have also logistic. Uh, we have to coordinate with. Or, but 
maybe, uh, maybe it's important also the, the Monica Clay's contribution about also the Inter-American and the European yeah. Convention I, to go I, first. I think oh, it's better right. to go with uh, Monica and uh, after the break having the, the discussion. Sorry, but uh, we have to keep into consideration several variables <laughs> from, from the logistic point of view also. Uh, Monica. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. And, and in a sense, it does make sense to, to immediately continue because, um, well, f first of all, my thanks also to the organizers of this event, Roberto, who I wish all the best, uh, Marco Dani and Raffaele Bifulco. Um, thank you for continuing this um, debate on um, supranational judiciary and especially also for pushing me into a, a new direction, um, pushing me outside my zone of comfort into uh, ECHR law. And then I have immediately have a confession to make. I'm not an ECHR lawyer. Um, so it was very good to be um, pushed in that direction and to rethink some of the things I thought I knew and understood. Plus, I must say, I, I have been wanting to go back to ECHR law, um, if not only after Opinion 213, which um, increased my sympathy with um, Strasbourg. In any case, so the bottom line of my uh, intervention is also that um, the Strasbourg court has been remarkably successful in involving national courts uh, without the use of the so-called uh, constitutionalizing doctrines that um, the ECJ has used. But before I uh, continue and um, zoom in on the ECHR, I would like to say a few words about this idea of the EU judiciary as a supranational judiciary. And of course, we have not uh, had the introduction by Roberto. Um, and I was not here for the introduction of uh, uh, yesterday. So maybe what I say makes no sense anymore after that. But I would just like to say a few words about that. And, and critique a bit the use of this concept of the, the suprana EU supranational judiciary that also includes national courts. And I can understand um, where it comes from. Article 19 of the TEU also mentions national courts as part of the EU judiciary. But I would prefer to continue um, to refer this simply as the EU judiciary as a composite or mixed judiciary consisting of a supranational court, the ECJ, maybe very old fashioned, um, and the national courts as national courts, but having an EU mandate. So in a to a certain extent, they, they, are, they have a mandate under EU law, but they remain national courts. They remain uh, agents of the state, but they have to give effect to that mandate and, and to a certain extent they have internalized it. So if, if you permit, I will continue to refer to the whole system as the EU judicial system. Now, this EU judicial system, and before I look at the ECHR and how it um, contrasts with the EU judicial system, just to refresh our memory, what are we talking about? What is special about the EU judicial system? And we, of course, know the narrative. So the ECJ, using the doctrines of direct effect and primacy of EU law, and using the preliminary reference procedure has developed this EU mandate for national courts and the national courts have by and large uh, accepted it. We know the drill, so at least doctrinally they have to a large extent accepted it. And the narrative then also is that the story goes that uh, the ECJ has been the most successful and effective international court, um, uh, most successful in enforcing and upholding its laws. So it is the supranational court par excellence of the supranational organization par excellence. And then between brackets, some thoughts about supranationalism. And I had this short beginning of a discussion with Jan um, about the concept of supranationalism. What is supranationalism? And in the paper, I will develop this a bit further. Um, is it a quantitative or a qualitative characteristic of an, of an organization? Um, probably both. And I have always considered most useful in this respect um, the old Joseph Weiler, um, well, he's not that old, but the article is an old article. Um, so on, on, the, <laughs> on the decisional and normative supranationalism. So decisional supranationalism, definitely the EU, EU goes beyond any other international organization. 
So it has an enormous uh, legislative capacity, um, QMV in many areas, uh, detailed legislation that changes and that deeply in, in, um, um, what is it? integrates into domestic legal orders, changes pol um, policies, etc. So there's no parallel to that in, in any international organization. And then there is the normative supranationalism proclaimed by the court, um, um, direct effect, primacy, fundamental rights, etc. We know that, but I think that there is a, a third element, and that may be the most important element of supranationalism, and that is the way in which the deep the, the EU um, deeply interferes in the domestic system, in the domestic constitutional system, and shifts relationships, changes, reshuffles the relationships between the organs of the state, and for our purposes, in this case, uh, more important, most important between the courts and the political and administrative organs. So EU, the EU and the Court of Justice open up the black box of the state and reshuffle relationships between uh, the organs of the state. So it's most intrusive in the domestic legal order. Okay, that, that was the brackets but, um, on uh, supranationalism. So we know the drill. The ECJ has developed all these theories, has developed um, the um, or doctrines, has developed the EU mandate of national courts, and national courts have accepted it at least um, doctrinally. So, in, for, um, and why have they done so? They have done so for many reasons. They have started to apply um, EU law for many reasons. First possibly because they were convinced by the logic and the reasoning of the Court of Justice in Van Gent and Loos and Cosa Enel. If you want to be a member state of the European Union, this comes with a number of consequences. You cannot unilaterally withdraw, which has a is a compelling argument. We like to think that it is not, but I, I still buy Van Gent and Loos and Cosa Enel. And so I think many uh, national court, um, judges have. But then there is also the empowerment thesis, so presumably national courts liked to be empowered against uh, political institutions, the intercourt competition argument, they liked, lower courts liked the competence to second guess higher courts, so it breaches the hierarchy between courts. National courts may have been inclined to accept it because it allows them to participate in this transnational choir, which is... Um, um, attractive for national courts, or they may simply have liked to participate with the supranational court, sending preliminary references, um, or possibly also simply, and especially for younger generation of judges, they have internalized the whole idea that EU law is simply part of national law. They have been taught that it is part of national law. So this has all become very normal doctrinally. But then if we look at the reality, the reality of national courts applying EU law we have to conclude that we do not know very well how in actual practice EU law is applied and whether or not and to what extent national courts do apply it. And we, what we do know is that there is an enormous divergence between member states, that it works better in some states than in others, but we also know that there is a fair amount, we don't even know how much, but a fair amount of reluctance on the part of national courts to apply EU law. And why is that? Um, well, to a certain extent, national courts lack expertise, and they admit that they lack expertise. This is a well-known well um, um, and, and much repeated um, well, statement by national courts. We don't know. It's too difficult. Or they may not like the EU. They may not even like EU law because it's too complex, because they have not... Um, well, they, they lack the expertise, or they lack... Or, or they don't like the choices, the legislative and policy choices that the EU makes. Um, and I know that many national judges, for instance, have problems applying the European arrest warrant, uh, EU law, or um, in asylum cases, the Dublin regulation. They simply have problems of, and this is what um, Miguel also yesterday referred to, justice of the EU. So, and... Of course, there is also still the, the old-fashioned, um, we do not like to second-guess political organs or higher courts. So the reality is that it is still fairly messy and that the idea of the EU having been so successful in involving national courts as a supranational 
ju um, judge and involving national courts in this supranational judiciary may not be as um, true as we like to believe as EU lawyers. So sorry for this. So how does this compare then to um, the ECHR and how it functions? Well, there too, there is this traditional narrative, right? So we have all been taught, I think, or at least in, this is what we teach uh, the students very often in, in the Netherlands or in Belgium or in um, the EU is a supranational or to a certain extent supranational. The ECHR, on the other hand, is still international, sticks to the um, um, techniques of an international court. And secondly, also domestically, for domestic courts, there is a difference. So whether they apply EU law or uh, ECHR law, there's a different register that opens in both cases. And yet, and here I confirm what um, Johan said, in practice, in many countries, and I know that, again, there is a diversity between countries, so the, the countries that I'm referring to mostly now is Belgium, the Netherlands, uh, but also the UK, um, to a certain extent uh, Spain, but also other countries, less so Italy. But in those countries, um, national courts make a habit of referring to the case law of the court of Strasbourg, make a habit of including ECHR law in their uh, judicial practice, and very often follow the case law of the Strasbourg court, even sometimes when they do not like the decisions of the Strasbourg court, if they disagree with them, and if it leads them to the difficult situation that they have to second guess national legislation, political actors, and choices of the, of, of the legislature. So how come, why is this, why, or can it indeed be that the Strasbourg court has been as successful as the Court of Justice in Luxembourg in convincing national courts to apply their law absent the uh, doctrines of direct effect, primacy, etc. So can it be true that to a certain extent in some countries the ECHR is as effective domestically as uh, EU law? Um, okay, so let's test this hypothesis. Now first, so on the place of the um, ECHR as a supranational court. This contrasts with what I just said. We have been taught that the EU is supranational, the ECHR is international, but when the, um, the Strasbourg court um, celebrated its 60th anniversary, it referred to itself as the first supranational court in Europe. And indeed, the court, obviously, its decisions are binding. It has compulsory jurisdiction. Um, contracting parties have chosen to subject themselves to the decisions of um, the court. Um, in that sense, they have limited their sovereignty, self-limited their sovereignty. The court in Strasbourg has an interpretive function um, based on Article 32 of the Convention, uh, an interpretive function that goes beyond the individual case. And it has also been embraced by the contracting parties. So to a certain extent, you can say that the Strasbourg court is a supranational court. Um, but there are, of course, important differences. In fact, the fact that many state courts follow ECHR law and consider themselves bound by the case law of the Strasbourg court is not so much a court-driven process. We know that in the EU, all this started with the development of the e uh, by the ECJ of the Pangenta Laws, Costa, Enel, etc. So it's imposed by um, Luxembourg, it's accepted by national courts, not so in the case of the ECHR. So in the case of the ECHR, there is no obligation imposed on the courts to follow the case law of the Strasbourg court. So that obligation imposed on courts as actors of the state has never been developed by the Strasbourg court. It's simply the contracting state has the obligation. The black box is not open. Now, why is that? Well, fairly obvious. There is no preliminary reference procedure. So there is no preliminary reference procedure that allows the Strasbourg court to intervene while the case is still pending before a national court. The Strasbourg court, like any other international court, with the exception of the EU, only intervenes at the end. So it only looks at the end result and the state liability of the case. And what the courts have done may have contributed to 
um, making the state liable, but the court in Strasbourg does not say anything about, or it cannot intervene during the process. So it has also not developed a direct effect doctrine or a primacy doctrine, and there is no narrative of an EU, of, of an ECHR mandate, or not the idea that the Strasbourg court requires a compliance by the courts. And in a sense, that is re remarkable. Because if you look at the preamble of the ECHR, it also speaks of um, a common heritage and of the aim of having a common um, and of, of unity between the member states in terms of um, fundamental rights protection. And also, you could think that there, there are leads in the ECHR for the development of some doctrine of direct effect and primacy. For instance, Article 13, the right to an effective remedy reads, Everyone whose rights and freedoms are set forth in this convention are violate, violated shall have an effective remedy before a national authority, notwithstanding that the violation has been committed by persons acting in an official capacity. It could have been used as a linchpin for direct effect. Of course, it refers to a national authority, but a creative court, audacious court, could have made that a requirement of um, direct effect. The same with Article 1, which could also have been used by an audacious court as a link for direct effect and primacy. The Strasbourg court chose not to do so. Um, in the Swedish engine drivers union case, or the James case, or more recently in the, uh, the Swiss case on um, Losonsky, Rose and Rose, um, the court sticks to this old-fashioned, we are an international court, the pattern is that of international law, um, and we do not intervene. Why is that? Why has the court never been jealous of the Luxembourg court that it was presumed to be so successful? Why has it not done so? Well, and then we have to go back, of course, to the origins of the ECHR, to the situational logic of the Strasbourg court as opposed to the uh, Luxembourg court. So the ideas are similar, yeah, an idea of common protection of human rights. So there is a common aim, a common ideal, but there is, of course, the idea of subsidiarity that was there from the very beginning, namely that protection should, in the first place, be national protection. The original drafts for the Convention included, in fact, a reference to uh, constitutions and the national laws of the contracting parties in the very Article 1 uh, of the Convention. So the idea was that states would always have uh, the obligation of states, the international obligation of states, would refer to compliance to their own constitutional system. So that was the original idea. And this very much is still inherent in the law of the ECHR. So in fact, the ECHR is, in contrast to the EU, not an aim in itself. In the ideal world, you could say, the ECHR should not even apply. The convention shouldn't apply. It's a safety net. In the ideal world, there would not be a need to apply it because any, every state would apply its own system. And of course, there is not the preliminary reference procedure. So, okay, so this explains why the Strasbourg Court has not gone that same path as the ECJ. And yet what we see more recently is that the Strasbourg Court has become more stringent and more specific in explaining and laying down what measures it wants from the states to comply with the ECHR obligations. So, um, for instance, in a case, um, no, and it has done so at the request of the contracting parties. So in the declarations of Interlag and Izmir, Brighton, the focus has come much more on this element of subsidiarity and that it is first and foremost the obligation of the contracting parties to comply with the ECHR and emphasizing in this respect also the role of national courts. So the emphasis has come more recently, much more on the role of national courts in enforcing the ECHR. Yet this is a political, it's, it's the contracting states themselves who draw the attention to the role of the, cons of the courts. It is not the court itself. Yet there, in the case law of the courts, there are also traces of that. If you take a case, for instance, like uh, Platonsen now, which is famous especially for its um, horizontal application of the ECHR, it's about the, the interpretation of a will and the question whether the Court of Strasbourg has not interfered too much in, in horizontal relationships. 
But in any case, there, the court said that the infringement by the, Andorian, by the Andorian state was the fact that the court had not interpreted the will in accordance with the convention. Presumably, there is an obligation to do so. Another example would be the Fabrice case in which the court said that, and this is a case about um, equal uh, treatment of uh, illegitimate children, which is, of course, one of the famous uh, decisions of the Strasbourg Court in Marx. Um, there the court said that national courts generally have an obligation to ensure that national legislation is in conformity with the convention. So again, it draws the attention to the courts specifically. And it says that um, especially where a state has introduced new legislation to implement an earlier judgment of the ECHR, this imposes an obligation on the domestic courts to ensure um, in conformity with their constitutional order and having regard to the principle of legal certainty, the full effect of convention standards as interpreted by the courts. So again, the attention is drawn to the role of the courts in upholding the ECHR, but there is this condition, they have to do so within, as far as is possible, in the constitutional order. And this probably is still the difference that the court does not interfere in those relationships between courts and uh, the other branches. The Court of Justice, Luxembourg, has no problem messing, messing around with these uh, relationships. Strasbourg is much more, um, uh, not so much inclined to do so. But we have seen this uh, more interference in the domestic systems, also in pilot judgments, the pilot judgment proceedings. So there is a trend of, um, from Strasbourg of interfering more in the domestic systems than it has done so before. A second trend that we can see is that uh, where um, until two decades ago, the idea was, well, the ECHR is, a, is an international system and it's up to the states to decide how they do it and there is no obligation to incorporate the ECHR. We know that at the moment, um, the ECHR has been incorporated in all the contracting parties in some way or other. And then there is an enormous diversity as to how this can be done. Some, and I'm not going to go into that. It can be done either um, as such or um, in the constitution with a reference to the ECHR or it can be done um, infra-constitutional or with special legislation. In any way, in any case, in all the member states today, of the European Union today and also beyond, the ECHR is now part of the law of the land. It has been incorporated. And as a consequence, many national courts now also simply apply the ECHR and the case law of the Strasbourg Court. Do they have to do so? Do they have to follow the case law of the Strasbourg Court? Um, as a matter of ECHR law, um, it's not so clear. It's not so clear that they do have to follow that. There is an obligation still. The obligation is an obligation of result. So if they do not follow the case law of the Strasbourg Court, they may contribute to making their state liable in Strasbourg. Um, but there is no independent obligation on the basis of the ECHR to apply ECHR law and to follow the case law of the Strasbourg Court. So courts may sometimes disagree with outcomes of uh, the Strasbourg um, system. They may disagree with decisions of the Strasbourg Court. So what can they do in that case? What if they do not follow the decisions of the Strasbourg Court? Well, of course, they can then contribute to a violation by the state of the ECHR, which may lead to cases being brought to Strasbourg, etc. However, and this is an, an, um, something that uh, Nicholas Bratza, so the, the previous um, UK judge in the Strasbourg Court said, he says this, and I think it's important, so I will quote him. I believe that it is right and healthy that national courts should continue to feel free to criticize Strasbourg judgments, where those judgments have applied principles which are unclear or inconsistent, or where they have misunderstood national law practices. But I also believe that it is important that the superior national courts should um, as put in the Horncastle judgment, on the rare occasions when they have concerns as to whether a decision of the Strasbourg Court sufficiently appreciates domestic process, decline to follow the Strasbourg Court. 
and give reasons for adopting this course. This has happened, of course, in the El Kabaji case, and it has led the Strasbourg court to change its uh, position. So this, in fact, is an expression of the fact that national courts may disagree, they may not follow the Strasbourg uh, case law, that in itself is not the violation, but may contribute to a violation by the state. And that, of course, contrasts with the situation in EU law. If in EU law, a, a, a court disagrees with the Luxembourg court and chooses not to follow it, that in itself is already the violation of EU law. Now, I still have to think about what this means in terms of our theory of constitutional pluralism, but I think that it means that um, Strasbourg court allows for much more constitutional pluralism or that it is inherent in the, in, in the whole system. Okay. Now, recently, I'm not going to say anything about Protocol 16, but Protocol 16 might introduce um, an, an um, advisory opinion uh, uh, procedure, so which resembles the preliminary reference procedure. Um, I am not so convinced that Protocol 16 is the way to go for all states, but it may well be the way to go for some states. So it depends on what you want to achieve. It may help courts, national courts, that are still in need of looking for legitimacy to second-guess uh, legislatures. So in some states with, with a weak judiciary and a weak tradition in fundamental rights, um, it may be an, an, uh, a good instrument to make the ECHR more effective. Um, but on the other hand, it may also invite the Strasbourg court to meddle much more in uh, domestic uh, issues, and it turns the subsidiarity principle upside down. So let's wait and see where, where that system goes. But a final point that I want to make, and I will uh, come to a conclusion. The final point that I want to make is this. Um, so we, we see that there are some resemblances in the sense, in, I think that the um, similarities between the ECHR and the EU as they apply in practice are most seen on the ground, on the work floor, so where the judges are sitting and deciding a case. I think in many countries and in many cases, they, they treat the ECHR and EU law in a similar way. They follow the case law of both courts in a very similar way, and the difference between supranational EU law and international um, ECHR law may not be so big. So to a certain extent, I think that there is some truth in, in this, this hypothesis that the ECHR, with its soft ways, has been as successful, or maybe even more successful, than the ECJ of um, convincing national courts to follow its case law. Um, and that, of course, is a very interesting and intriguing thought. Um, and I think that there is a need for more research, uh, both doctrinally and empirically, and also sociologically, as to how that functions. Um, where is the allegiance of national courts? Do they make a difference between compliance with EU law and with um, ECHR law? And what does it mean for the legitimacy of a sub supranational court? Um, but one final point that I, my absolute final point then is the following, and that is the interesting difference that I see between the way in which both courts um, seek um, um, or, or partner with national courts. So their PR, the PR of both courts in um, seeking this partnership with national courts is very, very different. We know that it is different in, in the sense that in EU law, it's direct effect primacy, so top down, whereas in Strasbourg, they wait more for what comes from the national courts. But it's also in, in the more subtle, in, in the, the practicalities. Compare the website of the European Court of Justice with that of the European Court in Strasbourg. Strasbourg makes a point of making its case law accessible, usable for national courts um, they have these fact sheets where they give the national courts all the information that they need on the current state of, of, the, of the art on certain issues. They provide training for judges. They have this um, annual opening of the year with um, dialogue uh, with judges. And I think that um, if you really want to partner with national courts, whether you are a real supranational court or have traces of supranationality, that is pro probably the way to go rather than imposing your, well, sometimes unintelligible decisions on national courts.
Okay, I will end here. Thank you very much to Professor Monica Kleis. Um, there's plenty of uh, issues for, for, for a rich discussion. And my suggestion is that we have uh, a break of 20 minutes. We'll reconvene at uh, 11.35 and we'll have, uh, uh, I think, uh, sufficient time for elaborating and discussing the topics emerged in the session. Thank you. <laughs>